Welcome to another session of the Happy Friday Committee, Happy Friday Mindset. Today we have um, Nick Williams in who is um, on video all the way from South Korea. He's a colonel in the United States military and a leader amongst men, uh, somebody who I admire. Thank you for joining us today. My pleasure, man. I appreciate you having me on here. Yes, yes. I wanted to get your um, perspective on the Happy Friday mindset, dealing with these uh, principles, being fearless, resilient, intuitive, determined, appreciative, and youthful. And I want to frame this in the context of the steps that you had to take in order to be where you're at today as far as um, you're on your way to retirement. Uh, you've been in the military for how long? Uh, 19 years, about to be 20 in January. Man. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah. So just being, um, you have to be fearless <laughs> in order to experience uh, some of the things that you have experienced. Um, so just take me on a journey as far as the fearless mindset that you had to have as far as just getting in and things that you had to go through. Okay. Well, um, I would say first off, um, just to be more specific, I'm a Lieutenant Colonel in the, uh, in the army. I won't be faking the funk. Like I'm a, like I'm a 06 Colonel. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. Just to get that part. So I'm a Lieutenant Colonel. Um, but yeah, man. So as, as far as being fearless, um, I, I can just start by saying that, you know, everybody has fear, right? Something that it's, it's a natural feeling that people have. And um, what I like to do is I like to take that and use it for my benefit. Right. So um, I use fear as fuel. Right. So there's been plenty of times um, in my life in the military and outside that there's been something that, that I've had some sort of um, anxiety about or fear about um, going into whether it's like some sort of military training, whether it's going to war, whether it's coming coming back from war, whether it's, you know, um, pursuing um, different type of uh, relationships, you know, getting married. Some of those things can be like scary or at least, you know, it's the, you know, a lot of time it's the fear of the unknown. Um, but I take that and I use it as fuel. Right. So I take my fear and turn it into fuel and use it to fuel me. Um, to learn more about and to prepare myself for whatever that situation may be. So um, let's say that um, when I first came into the military, you know, a lot of times for us, um, uh, and this is a big issue in the military, a lot of um, black people don't volunteer to go into combat arms, like the infantry armor and so on and so forth. And uh, I am, you know, definitely like most black people, I didn't volunteer for that. Cause I think a lot of times uh, we, we, it's hard enough being a black man in America already, right? We ain't signing up to the military to go yes, somewhere yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and make it harder on ourselves, right? And a lot of black people, I think, and I'm, I'm speaking from my own experience, and, and so this is my opinion, this is Nick Williams' opinion. Uh, I think a lot of black people, when we join the military, we're thinking life after the military, right? So we want to get a job that can produce some sort of um, benefits for us after we leave, right? So we want to go and maybe be an engineer in the military. We want to do, um, you know, human resources in the military because we know that once we leave the military, you know, if we don't plan on staying that entire time, that that produces a job outside. It translates to money in the civilian world. And so being an infantryman or being a tanker, that's not necessarily true, right? So if you're an infantryman in the military for, let's just say 20 years or five, let's say you for five years or four years, you do your first enlistment and then you get out. Like what what skills do that, does that translate into in the civilian world? What can you yes, be? Sir. You know what I mean? Like uh, you can, maybe you can be a security guard. Maybe you can be a, a military contractor and go back to war overseas or something like that. But if you want to do that, you should, probably could have just stayed in the military, right? If you were a tank driver, if you're a tanker, where, what is the, the civilian equivalent job to that? There wow. is none, right? Wow. Right. So a lot of us, we're thinking, you know, it's not that, it's definitely not the fact that, uh, black people aren't brave and black people aren't capable is it's just that we're thinking about other things right yeah, yeah, we're yeah, thinking yeah. Of in the big scheme of things right so um to get back to my point um i think you, you when you go into rotc you can put down on a sheet of paper your top three jobs that you want in the army 
and based on how you perform and what's going on and the needs of the army, they choose what job, you know, they choose a job for you, right? <clears throat> um, out of your top three, generally. Um, and so I remember the day when I got my choices back by um, my instructor, he came to me, he's like, hey, I got good news for you. You got one of your top, one of your top three. And he said, you got quartermaster. And I was like, okay, that's good. So quartermaster, for those who don't know, is like logistics in the army, right? So beans uh -huh. and bullets, you know, moving stuff around. You know what I mean? Like um, it could easily translate into a job at like Amazon or Walmart, you know, things like that. Um, anything working with logistics, I mean, FedEx, all those different things, it, it, it can translate. Yes, so I was sir. like, okay, that sounds good to me. And he said, but um, before you do that, you have, have what we call a branch detail to the infantry. So that means that you're going to go spend a certain amount of time in the infantry before you get to transfer over to that other job. Yes, sir. I didn't like that. You know what I mean? But, you know, <laughs> with the military, it, it does, you know, it, it doesn't matter what you like, right? You got to do, you sign the paper, so you got to go do what, you told, what you're told to do, right? Yes, sir. And so I, a lot of um, uh, anxiety and, you know, um, I really didn't know what to expect going into infantry school, right? Yes, sir. And just like, just like um, the statistics show, when I got there, there was 200 lieutenants, and out of the 200, about 20 were like black and or brown guys, so other than white. Yes, so out of 220 of us, yes. and um, you know, we we learn in ROTC, you learn basic infantry tactics, but this is you know on another level. And yes, you know, let also let's go back and say when I was in ROTC, one day I was coming back um, from PT and I look on TV and there's this crazy movie on that uh, shows some planes crashing into some buildings in New York. Wow. I was like, man, this movie's crazy. Oh, um, man. <laughs> and that, <laughs> that changed the whole, I was in ROTC before that, but that changed everything. It went, yes, from being like, it went from like playing soldier to like, you know, that when you graduate, it's, it's on. Yes, right? sir. Yes, sir. And, and so when I went into infantry, when I went into infantry school, that was the direct pipeline to Afghan and Iraq. Yes, Afghanistan. Sir. Right, right. So um, when we were in infantry school, they'd be like, hey, you know, remember Lieutenant, remember Lieutenant uh, Lindsay, who was, uh, you know, in second platoon in the class before you? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Like, yeah, he did. You know what I mean? Damn. So y'all keep playing around out here thinking it's a game. You know, y'all going straight from here to your unit or, or to Ranger school, airborne school, and then you're going to Iraq or Afghanistan. And that was like, those, those are the facts, right? And so... Right. You can imagine there was a lot of um, anxiety when it came to, you know, being able to perform there. And then also, you know, what's, what was going to be my follow on assignment? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, but long story short, um, when I was in infantry school, you know, I I did my best to really like bear down and learn all of the tactics. And, and um, you know, I'm I can I can swim a little bit, but there I learned how to swim much better. That's one of the things that you have to do to be able to go to Ranger School. Um, yes, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother story that I won't get into. But yes, you know, um, I, I I stopped and and uh, I, I uh, took the time to train myself after after class or after work. So when everybody else would get off, a lot of us brown and black guys, uh, we would go to the swimming pool and practice swimming uh, wow. because that's something that was required for us in order to that we knew we had to do in order to pass. Uh, past ranger school um you know i i um i volunteered to go to um to airborne school mm. then i started looking up all the things and learning more about what it was uh like uh what it was like and what was required to do um to do a, a static line jump out of an aircraft you know and so uh, i basically immersed myself in that life so that when i when it was time for me to go i felt much more um safe and so to, to bring it all back is I, I use that fuel to, I mean, I use that fear, correction, I use that fear as fuel to get me through those um, situations and to push me to learn more about whatever it was I was scared of. Did you have any uh, setbacks along the way? And this is leading into being resilient. Any mm -hmm. setbacks along the way as far as um, what you experience, uh, especially being in a war zone, um, what made you get up every day and face your fears? And mm -hmm. 
Well, man, I, I had many, many, many setbacks, <laughs> many setbacks. Um, uh, one of the ones was, like I said, I, I mentioned uh, Ranger School, right? So I failed, I failed out of Ranger School, um, and and if you know, it was on the swim test, right? So yes. one of the tests, that, one of the tests you have to do in order to um, pass Ranger School on the first day, you got to go in like at two in the morning. You have to they do an inventory of all your stuff. It's really like you know, a high pressure situation. Um, once uh, you get all your stuff, make they make sure you have all your stuff. You go do a PT test. After you do the PT test, you do a five mile run. After a five mile run, they take you to a pool, and you have to um, have all of your equipment on um, and uh, and a rifle. And then they push you in the pool, and you have to swim to the side of the pool without uh, showing any signs of fear or panic. Wow! Right. So um, pass the PT test, no problem. That's that's easy work for me. <laughs> um, got to the pool. I I I learned I I passed that test before, um, but this was a different type of situation. It was a little bit you know higher pressure and everything. Uh -huh. And that day I I just didn't have it. It was like uh, it and it was <laughs> it was funny because um, the way they do it is they say, "Hey, what's 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 your name, um, Ranger? You know, you tell me your name. Like, where are you from? And like when you open your mouth to say where you're from, they just kick you into the pool. Like you're like, ah, oh, bam, they kick you into the pool. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember, like, <laughs> I remember thinking all the way to the bottom of the pool, like, uh, you, you've seen um, the movie uh, Get Out? Yeah, 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 yeah. So on Get Out, when he was going to the sunken place and he was just falling back. Yeah, like yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was <laughs> yeah. falling into the, I went all the way to the bottom, man. And wow. um, I remember I got to the bottom of the pool, had my rifle, and I'm just walking on the bottom of the pool, like, <laughs> wow. I'm just going Far as I can, uh, you know, walking at the bottom before I come up. And yeah, start yeah, trying to yeah, swim. yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I came back up and I came back up out of the water, start trying to swim, and went right back down again. And uh, you, you know, you got your boots, you got your fatigues on, you got an LBE on all that stuff. Yeah. And uh, I remember I, when I went back down again, I was like, man, I wonder if they going somebody gonna get me. <laughs> 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 and then I saw that hook. I saw that hook come in. That hook came in. Grab me up out. They're like, all right, Ranger, get get over to the side. So you got to go to the side. Then you get another try, right? Wow. Uh, second 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 try was went worse. You know what yeah. I mean? So and then that's the end. You you kicked out of school if you don't pass that. Wow. Um, and so uh, the crazy thing about it is, so there was a there was a, another dude there, a white guy. Maybe that's significant. Maybe it's not. But he was like, man, I failed it. This, that's not right, man. They shouldn't have made us do all them push-ups before. I'm going to complain. So he lodged a complaint, which is funny because I never would have thought to do anything like that. Maybe this is a um, a demonstration of like white privilege and how white people just feel like, man, if, and I'm thinking the rules are the rules. You know what I'm saying? Yes, you fail, yes, you out. You know what I mean? He was like, no, nah, fuck you. He's like, no, nah, forget that. You know what I'm saying? I'm going yeah, to yeah, go yeah. lodge. He lodged a complaint. And so, like, we were all, I had already packed up all my stuff and everything, getting ready to go. At least I'm just like, you know, I'm kind of over it. Like, uh -huh. I have a little sense, of, got a sense of relief. You know what I mean? Like, well, oh, well, I guess I just got to go back and train again and come back. Uh -huh. And uh, the, the instructors come in and they like, hey, since this, uh, you know, this asshole over here went and complained, he said we made y'all, uh, we smoked y'all too much before you got in the pool. Everybody has to test again. Wow. Wow. So I had to go back and fail two more times. <laughs> I didn't get no better, you know what I'm saying? I didn't get no better. But it was even, you know, I don't think I did. I think I did even worse on the next two times, right? Wow. And so, and this is the beginning of my army career, you know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah. it's not starting very well. So um, how does that? How does that help you as far as like being in the military? And what? I was what? As far as like help. How does that help you? The question is, how does that help you in terms of being in the military and things that you've learned help you with your, and the next principle is intuition, intuitive. Oh, How does that help right. you with being, following your intuition as just in your everyday life? Aside from the military, just walking around the way you think, the way you internalize things. How, okay. did, how did that help you? So, first of all, if I could, if I could go back, so to to 
to put a bow on the whole thing. Okay. Like it, eventually you have to come back and you have to talk to people and tell them what you're going to do in order to make yourself better. So that next time you go, you don't, you don't fail again. Okay. Um, and so you, you have to stand up in front of people and, and say this, right? So that's one of the things where they, they make you resilient, right? They okay. force you in order to, um, dim, to either demonstrate your resilience or not, right? And mm-hmm. so after you fail around your school, you have to go in front of your commander and the sergeant major, and they're going to say, they say, do you want to go back? And there's only one right answer, right? You know what yeah. I mean? In order to demonstrate your resilience, right? And you got to say, uh-huh. yes, I want to go and what are you going to do to make sure that the same thing doesn't happen when you go back? And then you have to come up with your training plan for yourself um, and tell them, you know, exactly what you're going to do. And so that's what I did. I came out like, yeah, I, I want to go back and I'm going to go to the pool every day um, and, and train my, my butt off to make sure that when the next time I get in that pool, I can pass the test. Uh-huh. Um, there were some more events that happened that I didn't have any control of and I wasn't able to go <laughs> But I, I was ready to do that. And um, that's just, you know, my career starting off like that with a couple of, you know, failures um, and things that could have, you know, made me feel like I was lesser of, of a soldier. I didn't yeah. let those things, I let them fuel me um, in the future, you know, to prove myself um, as a competent soldier, even though I didn't have a range of tab. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. That's that. Um, so yeah, the, so the question was as far as like just you being a soldier and you know that playing a part in your everyday life, just in your personality and everything, because I know it it's like fusion of being a soldier and the way you think, the way you internalize things. Um, how does that work with your intuition? Okay. Well, I think my intuition helps me a lot in being a leader, um, a lot with just being emotionally intelligent and being able to lead a a diverse group of soldiers. Um, In my own personal philosophy of leadership, I don't I don't treat everybody the same. Right. Um, You have to take bodies. Some people think treating everybody the same is good. And I'm not I'm not a believer that. Right. You have to treat everybody with equity. Right. But some people. Some people need something different from their leader. Some people may need their leader to kick them in the butt. Yes, some sir. people, some people may um, need their leader to pat them on the back. Yes, you know sir. what I mean? So I pride myself in being intuitive and being able to look at people and determine, you know, the right time and the right way to, to lead them um, through, you know, through their failures and through also to encourage them after their, their victories, you know? So um, I think if you go and, Go, go back and talk to some of the soldiers that, that I've led over the years, they would say that, oh, yeah, he was a pretty good leader. And I think that my um, emotional intelligence and um, my intuition would, has you know, helped me in, in being that type of leader. Excellent, excellent. Uh, going into the next principle, which is determination, how does that help you? And how do you remain determined? Uh, seeing this is your all your retirement year or coming up on your retirement year, how did how did you remain determined? Oh, I'm determined to retire. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, the way that um, the way the military is set up, right? It, um, especially for officers, it's up or out, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's for for all ranks, but for and you know, particularly as an officer, you got to move up in the ranks or you got to get out, right? And uh-huh. so for me. I had to make the rank of lieutenant colonel or I wasn't going to make it to 20 years. I was going to make it to like 18 um, as a major. And then that's not good enough. Right. You need 20 in order to retire to get your full retirement. benefits. So um, I was determined to do that. And so I took hard jobs. I went to places that were, you know, maybe not so nice um, and, you know, volunteer for things um, because I was determined to do that. I look at the military as, um, a investment and I look at my service as an investment for me right so I'm going to invest 20 years of my life so that I can get you know hopefully 40 more or more to do what I want to do right so I'm paying in 20 I'm paying in 20 which I think that's a good investment I'm paying in 20 years to the military um, with my time and you know time away from my family and all those other sacrifices 
Now the military pays pretty good too, and it has benefits. So I'm not doing it for free. Uh-huh. But also in the back, after that 20 years, I get to go do whatever I want to do. I get to go and be civilian Nick. I get to go to go wherever I want to go, whenever I want to go there. I can wear my hair however I want to do my facial hair however I want to do it. <laughs> Just enjoy life. And so um uh I was I'm and I'm determined to reap those the benefits of my 20 years of military service, right? So just to look at it as from a practical standpoint, take out of, you know, take out the, you know, patriotism and doing the good thing for my family. And that's, that's great. You know, and my family's military tradition, all those things are great, but to look at it from a practical standpoint, my military service is a 20 year investment and I'm about to cash out. Wow. Wow. The, okay. So cashing out, it leads to the next one, it, which with next principle, which is appreciation. <laughs> How do you show appreciation for just your life in general, the things you experience, the things that you have accomplished, and you know, just the things that you have learned? And uh, well, so I think it goes without saying, but I'll say it like I'm appreciative to my family because you know they're my support system. So without my wife and my kids, my mom and dad and grandmothers and grandfathers or grandfather when he was here um like I couldn't have done this right they supported me along the way so without that sort support system um I I wouldn't be where I am today um and, and without all the lessons and every, everything that they they've done for me um with that being said though I really appreciate the military and I that's why I recommend the military I wish there was mandatory military service for everybody and yes, and for me, it's not about patriotism, but I think that what, what some of us lack as far as discipline and like how to live um, efficiently, and um, I, I think the military gets you some of those things, can give you a lot of those things. They teach you how to budget and they teach you how to plan. Um, um, they teach you, you know, how to be responsible. They make you um, have to be physical fit, physically fit. So all those things, you have to work them into your life. And so by the time you leave the military, whether it's after four years or after 20 years, those things are uh, uh, ingrained into who you are. And so I really appreciate that about the military, because when I look out, when I look out here in the real world, man, the civilian world, I feel like a lot of people out here just living willy nilly. You know what I'm saying? They just like, you know what I'm saying? They like feather in the wood or feather in the wind, you know, but I plan everything. I'm a meticulous planner. And guess what? When you plan stuff, um, some people say like, when you plan, God laughs at you. Right. Yes. Sir. I don't think that's true. <laughs> when he plans, when you plan, God is like, okay, I see you. All right. Okay. You got some plans. Okay. <laughs> now don't, now don't get it twisted though. After you make your plans, uh, there's a saying in the military that no, no plan survives first enemy contact. Right. Mm-hmm. So once, once you get come in contact with the enemy, your plan starts to change and that's okay. Right. And so that's what people got to realize is like, once, you can make plans, but something always goes wrong. You just yeah. gotta adjust the plan. You adjust your plan a little bit yes, to the left. Yes, yes, make a little, it bit to the, uh, a little bit to the right, right? Yes, There's no reason because you know that your, your plan is not gonna turn out perfect, is not a reason not to plan. Right. Yes, so I, I I love the way the military teaches you how to backwards plan. You get your goal or whatever it is, your mission that you're trying to accomplish, and you start at the end yes, and sir. you say, Oh, I want to. Let's just say, I want to go to Africa on vacation. Let's just say it's vacation. I want to go to Africa on vacation. Okay. Uh, That is the end that I want to get to. Now, what are all the things that I got to do to make sure that happens? Oh, I need money. How much does it cost? Okay. It costs, you know, let's say uh, $1,000. It costs more than that, right? But it costs $1,000. How much time do I have? So I have 12 months to get $1,000. That means I need to save this amount of money per month, right? In order yes, to get there. What are the things that are required? What is the equipment that's required for me to travel to Africa? Oh, I should have a safari hat. I should have some sunglasses. I need to make a list of equipment that I need to take with me so that when I get there, I don't need these things. Um, yes. How am I going to get there? Um, I'm going to take a taxi to uh, to the airport and take the take the plane to Africa. When I get off in Ghana, I'm going to take a taxi to my, you know, all those things, the logistics of it all. Yes, sir. That's, Second nature to me. It's easy. And I, I like doing it. You know yes, what I mean? Sir. Yes, sir. Every time I make plans like that, 
something happens, that, you know, oh man, I missed the, <laughs> or you know, I mean, the plane, the plane broke down. I, I ain't missing no plane, but you know, the plane broke down, or the other connecting flight was late, so you missed the plane. Those things happen. But if you have a framework, it's easy to, you know, jump, jump off, and then jump back into your plan. So something bad happens, you know, where you can jump off and jump back into your plan. You have to, you know, you have to plan. You have to plan in life, man. If you, if you're not plan. And you have to plan your life on that detail. It, that was just a, a vacation. You have to have like a five-year plan. Where do you want to be in five years? Oh, I want to be the, the manager of my section at work. What does that require? Oh, it requires a certain level of education. Okay, I need to get that education. Okay, where's a school? Okay, I need to get accepted. Okay, I need money. Okay, you need to, it, you got to do it. Like, how old are my kids going to be at that time I'm doing it? Oh, they're going to be going into elementary school, that means I don't need daycare. That means I will have money at that time that I'll be able to, you got to go into the details, man. And detail, people who are successful do detail planning like that. Absolutely. And I can promise you, I can promise you, you could guarantee to be, um, <laughs> not to be successful, okay? You're guaranteed to fail a lot if you don't plan. Absolutely. So that's Absolutely. what I appreciate about the military. Absolutely. Uh, as yeah. far as uh, being youthful, I know you're a world traveler. What uh, countries have you visited? Man, I've been to, I think, 33, I think 33 countries. But, excuse me, just to name a few, I go um, starting over here, South Korea, Japan, um, Vietnam, the Philippines, um, Afghanistan, Iraq, Kuwait, Qatar, um, Germany, France, um, Switzerland, Sweden, Denmark, Russia, um, uh, Liechtenstein, um, Luxembourg, um, Spain, um, Malta, Morocco, and more. <laughs> <laughs> Canada, Mexico, you know, here. Yeah. So on the so what keeps you youthful and uh, just uh, is it just traveling? Yes, man. I think um, traveling can help keep us all youthful, right? Because what do we do most of the time when we were kids, right? We're doing discovery, learning. We're yes, exploring. Sir. We're exploring, and all we doing it. All I'm doing as an adult is I'm doing it on a grown up level, right? So now instead of exploring my backyard and my neighborhood, I'm exploring the world, yes, right? Sir. And nothing. There's nothing more that makes you feel more youthful than seeing something in person that you've never seen before, right? right. Something to give you a sense of like awe, right? So when you look at something, be like, oh man, like, look at that. Like there's that thing that I read about or there's that thing that I never even heard of and I'm, and I'm seeing for the first time. There's, there's nothing like that um, um, in the world yes, other than travel, right? Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I think, um, you know that song back in the day, um, Nas. What was the name of the song when he was like, "It's mine, it's mine." Yeah, whose Who, world is it? World is this? Yeah, the okay. world is yours. Yeah, the world yeah, is yeah. yours. Yeah. Okay, so back, back in the day, I used to think when he meant when he was saying the world is yours, I took it as like you can do anything that you want to do, right? Mm. Like, like you could do anything you want to do. The world is your oyster, as some people say. Um, but now I look at it from a slightly different standpoint. I look at it as like the world is actually yours. Like wow. you are, a citizen, you are a citizen of the world. Absolutely, you know what I'm absolutely. Right, the whole world belongs to you. Like so, if you are just spending your time on Earth, just in America, it's like you have a mansion and you just stay in the basement the whole time. Wow, wow. you know what I'm saying? Wow. The whole world, the whole world belongs to you. Or like, let's not say I ain't trying to say America's a basement. Let's say you stay in the living room. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. All right. All right. The living room where all the entertainment is, you know, where the TV is. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, where the Nintendo is and all whatever it is you like to play. You spend all your time in the living room, but you got a, you know, a, a 15 room mansion and you spend only, you only spend time in the living room. The world is yours, man. Wow. Especially, man, man, the world is, the world is ours. We got to realize that. And so go around the world, explore, you know, feel youthful while you're out there doing it. I mean, I'm telling you, like, there's nothing like it. That's why I try to encourage you and all my other um, brothers to come see me whenever I'm anywhere. Yes, sir. I, yes, sir. The open invitation. When I was in Germany, when I was in Hawaii, 
Yes. I was, <laughs> but I'm here, you know. I'm always like, oh, y'all, hey, y'all, come visit. Y'all got a place to stay. And, you know, if y'all don't take advantage of that, you know, that's on. That's on yes, y'all. yes. <laughs> but, but there's there's nothing there's nothing better than um, seeing a new place and traveling the world with people that you love, man. Yes, sir. Like people that you love. So my boys, my family. Yeah, I'm doing it with my family. We do it. That's automatic. So I, I get I get enough of that to sustain me. But the only thing that would be icing on the cake is if my boys would come out and travel with me and we yes, go sir. see these things. Yes, sir. Yeah. We're coming. We're coming. We're coming. Oh, I hear you. I hear you talking. <laughs> So, uh, so out of all these principles, being fearless, resilient, intuitive, determined, appreciative, and youthful, what principle sticks out to you the most and why? Man, I mean, they all are so um, key to having a happy life, right? Yes, um, and they, they're all key in being successful, but I would go with youthful, man, and travel. Because, uh, and I'm tying travel to being youthful, right? Because yes, there's there's no better teacher of mm. all these different. You know what I mean? You when I when I was in different countries, that's when I had to be my most resilient. You know, when I was in different countries, that's when I had to use my intuition the most. Mm. When I'm in other traveling, that's when I feel my most youthful. You know what I mean? And and you can go down the list. Mm. Um, it's just that experience of traveling is nothing like it, man. Like. <clears throat> I think I told this to you before is you cannot know who you truly are unless you travel the world. Yes, you, don't know who you, are. you don't know who you are. Yes, sir. And I, I, I give you an example. If you took a baby, right? Uh-huh. A little baby, you put it in a room with four walls and, you know, four stark white walls, just put the baby in the room and the baby grew up in that room. Didn't see it. Never saw another person. Mm-hmm. Um, you can put a mirror in the room and the baby could see themselves perfectly, a, a nice crystal clear mirror. Mm-hmm. And that, if that baby grew up, let's just say to be, uh, to, to be a grown person, that baby would know absolutely nothing about themselves. Mm. Even though they're in there with themselves. Yes, sir. You can look at yourself and see everything about yourself, but you still don't know who you are in this, in this world because you don't know your place in the world. Yes, sir. Stay in America, and if like talking to my black folks, if you stay in America, you think you are whoever, whatever your position is in America, and mm. that ain't you. Mm. That ain't you. You might be, and let's take it to just something like that you can't control. And let's not talk about race right now. Talk about let's say your height. Mm-hmm. You might be five seven dude, right? And you walking around America like man, everybody calling me short. You know what I mean? I'm a yes, short sir. guy. Yes, sir. Right? And then oh, you get on a plane. And you go to the Philippines, and now you you just as tall or taller than most people there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. yes. So you going around your whole life thinking you're short, and you're not short. Yes, you sir. actually over here, you an average height guy. Yes, sir. Let's say you live in America, and everybody's like, "Oh man, you you black and you ugly." You know what yes, I mean? Sir. Yes, sir. You get on a plane and you go over to uh, Nigeria or someplace. Yes. Everybody looks like you. And you black and beautiful. Yes, sir. You know I mean? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I mean, you stay in America, and you at the at amongst the bottom of the totem pole in America's society, right? As a black person. Yes, sir. Right, but then you go to another country, plenty of other countries where they admire black people from yes, America, sir. black Americans. Yes, right? sir. We are special, right? We are special people. Yes, so sir. they look at black Americans like. We, you're not like, we're similar, but we're not the same. They're like, oh, you a black American. Y'all do everything. Yes, sir. Y'all, yes, make, sir. <laughs> y'all, y'all run the world. Yeah. You know yeah, what I'm yeah. Y'all make all the music. Y'all make all the fashion. You know what I mean? Y'all make, you know, all the, my favorite athletes are black. You know what I mean? Yes, sir. Black yes, American. Sir. Um, you have to travel to know who you, who you really truly are. Yes, that's, why I'm, that's what I'm trying to get to. So if you just stay in your bubble in America, that's not you, man. You ain't gonna know. You ain't gonna know. You ain't gonna know. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, um, thank you again for coming on and doing this interview. Um, We'll talk offline, but yeah, definitely. Thank you for coming on and uh, doing this interview with us. I know this is going to help out a whole lot of people. Um, So thank you. Yeah, man. Hey, I appreciate you inviting me on here to do this. You know, I'm 
you know, some people don't believe it, but I, I'd rather play the background. You know what I mean? Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> in the back making moves man but i like what you're doing on here man i think it's a great great thing that you're doing i think that it was an awesome idea and i'm just happy to be a part of it man so i appreciate, appreciate it appreciate it